go, go, go. That's tomorrow. That's and tomorrow. That is up. That is up. That's tomorrow. And and tomorrow. That is it for us that today. Is it for us and today. We will leave you we will with leave you with a. I can't do it. I can't do it. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. Do it live. Do it live. I'll write it. I'll do it live. We'll do it live. Fucking thing. Fucking suck. thing. Suck. That's tomorrow, and that's that tomorrow, is it for us that today. Is it for us today. I'm Thanks Noel again for Island. watching. Thanks we'll again for leaving watching. with Sting and a cut off his new album. Take it away. Take it away. Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? on? This show is coming from 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 What's up, everybody? It is your boy, Lou Martinez, a.k.a. Big Chief Burrito, live with you on a Thursday. Fireside Chats with Big Chief Burrito, live from the Burrito Lodge in beautiful Chula Vista, San Diego, California. Hope everybody's having a happy new year. I just realized my camera's at a bit of a, a Dutch angle here. Uh, but uh, thank you for everybody uh, that's that's tuning in or will tune in. If you're just uh, watching this on a VOD, if you're listening uh, on the podcast, which I release the next day via Spotify, Pandora, and everywhere else you get your podcast, please make sure you give us a like, follow on your favorite podcast platform under the 2 a.m. burrito banner. And if you are inclined, uh, leave us a, a review. That really helps out a lot. And if you're watching us live on twitch.tv slash 2am burrito, youtube.com slash 2am burrito, or on facebook.com slash 2am burrito, leave a like on the stream, leave a comment, ask a question. We're going to be talking about indie filmmaking, photography, a little doge, a little doge talk, a little maybe, you know, a little modern crypto talk. And one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about, which is, you know, the other day I was walking down the street, somebody tried to offer me um, a token. And and then I took a look at the token, and then it turns out it was fungible. And, you know, it's just an epidemic out there right now, guys. Make sure that if you get tokens, they're non-fungible. I like my tokens non-fungible. If you guys don't know what that means, then you're not up on the crypto NFT craze. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that. That was just a little bit. Um, my guest tonight, um, Angela Wong, um, 
I've been Facebook friends with her for a while just because we're in the same industry in the same city. And I don't know if I've ever really run into her at any meetings or stuff, but I've always just been cordial to her. And I, and I, and I took a look at her photography and her, and her film stuff and some of her posts. And, and I think she has an incredibly good eye for, for, for framing, for composition and her pictures. And I mean, she's a pro filmmaker and we're trying to expand, um, you know, the group of people that we talk to so we can learn from each other and talk about the film industry, um, both professional and soulless corporate work uh, from different perspectives. So I was glad when she agreed to come on my show. So let's welcome Angela to the stream. Yo, what's up? Thanks for having me. <laughs> I really enjoyed uh, uh, your reactions to my intro music as I was watching it. I was, I was, I always like to keep an eye on how people are reacting to my little nonsense before the stream starts. No, I love that. Um, I was on a I was on a webinar meeting yesterday, and it was like just not as cool. So <laughs> huge, uh, you know, applause for you, man. That's super. Thank cool. you, thank you. Uh, let's jump into it, Angela. You're a you um you're a filmmaker, photographer. You dabble in the crypto streets. Uh, you have your own brand of of, of coffee. Um, we we talked a little bit, it's sort of our preamble to to this talk in terms of what you thought was an interesting topic, which was um. The choices that people had to make uh, over the last two years during the pandemic, um, in terms of you know, there's 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 notes out there that businesses thought 15% of their employees were never going to come back into office, and for some businesses, 50 55% of employees are like, I ain't coming back. I'm never. I'm not coming back. So a lot of people had to make changes in their life, deciding you know, stay at home is the way to go. A lot of people had to sort of. Uh, analyze where they were at in terms of their career and their goals and stuff like that. Can you, you tell us a little bit of something about like what your process was like over the last two years? Yeah, it was um, not expected at all. Um, I got let go at the end of 2020 and uh, you know, I had to, you know, burn through a lot of savings and really double down on my freelance gigs. So, or my freelance clients. So um it kind of made me really value being an entrepreneur because um, at the end of the day, a corporation can just be like, no, nah, we're done with you. Bye. And, uh, but your clients, you know, they might be going through stuff too, but you know, they, um, they can give you referrals. They can hire you again, as long as you have a good relationship with them and you just keep growing that. Um, it's made me really double down on that. So. Well, you were, what, what industry were you working in pre pandemic? Um, it was still video, but it was for a corporation. So oh, okay. it was like a, almost like a regular nine to five, come in, come edit, uh, and then go home. And then I would still freelance on the side. And, and I'm so glad that I did despite having full-time work. Right. Cause that set you up for being able to just pivot and just go straight freelance. Yeah. A hundred percent. Do you think that you'd still be t stuck in like uh, soulless corporate work if, if it, it hadn't happened? Or were you in the back of your mind already sort of planning your escape? To be honest, uh, yeah, I would I would still be stuck in that nine to five hating it. Um, so I'm actually really, really grateful that the whole thing happened. And, um, you know, a lot of people got let go or they left. And that opened up opportunities for, you know, people like me to step in and pick up new freelance gigs. So. Um, I've been pretty lucky uh, this, <laughs> despite the the lockdown, despite the pandemic. So I don't know how how was it for you? Well, yeah, the, it well, uh, you know, people know that I I was already working from home because I take care of my elderly dad. Um, you know, that's my I have two full time jobs. I work from home, and then I I'm, I'm a caretaker for him. Um, and so initially I was, I was stuck. I, I was only seeing the people that lived in my house and, you know, my girl and her son, which are the only people that I interact with outside of my home for the first four to six months. Um, because, you know, uh, we were both, me and my dad both had comorbidities and, and issues that, that, that we, that, you know, that the doctor said we needed to, to isolate and stuff like that. So my podcast is a direct um, I always wanted to start re do another podcast. Like uh, I said, I did a podcast called Indie Apocalypse. We did over a hundred episodes, and the and the focus of that podcast was indie filmmaking with San Diego as sort of a um, a test ground for 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 talking about indie filmmaking. And this gave me the ability and the time to go back and re-edit some stuff that I had that I never finished and start up a new, you know, start this 
the fireside chats and other podcasts and streams that I did mostly to stay creative, but also to be able to have some human interaction and to, mm -hmm. you know, go about the process and film of meeting people, meeting new people, meeting new filmmakers and, and collaborating on their work. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the, the world took a toll and, um, and, 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 and I wish I hadn't, but, but I think that, that it did, it did allow me to recenter. And I think that it, hopefully as a people to be corny, uh, we come out of this with a better understanding of what's important. And, and, and I think specifically for, in terms of the workplace, you know, number one, a bunch of the jobs they told you you couldn't do remote. You absolutely can do remote. And you don't need to go into the office to be efficient and have your boss hovering over you and 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 waste uh, one twelfth of your life in transit every day. Um, and uh, and hopefully it's a new landscape for filmmakers and and it and it brought up a lot of opportunities for freelancers. Um, Kurt from Florida, our Florida man, checking in. Thanks for stopping by. Kurt does all the music for us uh, for cool. for the pod, and uh, he does a, a bunch of the music for me. Thanks for stopping by, buddy. Um, Yo, I'm originally well, from Florida, <laughs> so really? shout out to Kurt. <laughs> what, what part of Florida are you originally from? Uh, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've been here though for at least nine to ten years now so it's pretty crazy coming up i'm like i'm like torn between should i stay or should i move because it's so expensive so i've been like thinking about it but i'm also just kind of like all my contacts are here it would really be hard to just like up and leave so that's the other part where if you have a purely remote job i mean you have a i mean you you can do most of your business from home but you got to shoot on location so yeah um, I think that's another thing where people are like, I can do my job from home. I'm only hanging out with the people inside of my house. I can get a three bedroom in fucking Texas for six hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, why am I leaving? Why am I? Why am I living in Claremont or uh, by the exactly. by the beach again, paying twenty five hundred? You know, like it's ridiculous. Exactly. Exactly. My, bro my brother sends me uh, apartments from uh, Missouri, and he's like, "You should come out to Missouri." And it's like, and he shows me these pictures of these like four bedroom hardwood townhouses, two car garages, gigantic yard. And he's like $900. And wow. I'm just like, and I'm like, how's the fiber internet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Missouri. Okay. But what do you do for fun out there? Oh my God. I think you, I think, I think what you do is you stay away from people that want to kidnap you and chop you up in the Ozarks. <laughs> is what you do is is what i would do i would be trying to stay away from people that would be look at that beater let's get him and throw him in the freaking out you know <laughs> that would be my sport um yeah uh kurt's up in naples florida and he can't stand it because he, he knew <laughs> where a bunch of old and married people were like an idiot Move, come back kurt san diego misses you um but you went from florida and then you went to school in new york though ithaca right yeah yeah i went to ithaca college god that was feels like forever ago um, and yeah. that was like the antithesis of Florida. So it was upstate. It was ton of snow. It was really my first time like living in a snowy town. Um, I remember building a snowman at like, what, what was I like 19, 20? Oh, I, uh, I, I believe the statute of limitations is, is, is over on this, but, um, my friend, uh, I had friends that, that if you know, the SUNY, uh, uh, university system in New York, um, mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, SUNY Cortland and then SUNY Oneonta and then Buffalo and a bunch of other uh, state universities and Ithaca and a bunch of other schools up north. So I would take my, I would take the, I think it's called the Green Hornet or the Green Grasshopper or something. There's a bus, there's a Greyhound equivalent mm -hmm. that goes up to upstate. And I would take a giant ass bag of weed and I would go and I would go visit each of my friends because I had friends in each of the colleges and I'd post up with them for a couple of days, sell some weed, move on to the next college, sell some weed, and then eventually come back down to Queens. Wow, uh, hustling. That, that, was, that. That, was, that was my late 90s hustle <laughs> and I was to go visit my, my friends in school. Um, but when did the... Um, when did the passion for the arts, uh, for framing a photograph, for capturing, you know, a few seconds of, of life uh, sort of hit you? Was it something that you came upon early or did you have to go to school and, 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 and have some hits and misses before you, you realized what, that, that it was something that you wanted to focus on? Yeah, so I took a um, 
television class um, in high school. And it honestly just like changed the tra trajectory of everything. Um, I had been doing music a lot. I grew up playing piano um, and, and then I learned the saxophone. Um, and I thought I was gonna do music, but you know, once I took that class, I was, I was hooked. There's something about capturing life on, on camera that's just really exciting to me. Do you, because I, I know you take a lot of care with the, with the photographs that you, that you post and stuff like that. Do you, do you prefer the still image to the moving image if you had to like dedicate yourself to just one or the other? I've mostly dedicated myself to the moving image um, and only like recently got into, you know, still life. Um, they both have just, you know, really different pros and cons. Um, sometimes I take a photograph and I'm like, God, I wish that was on video instead. Or, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll take video and I was like, well, that would have been much easier to edit if it were a photograph. So, you know, just, uh, just going back and forth and having fun with them is I, I try not to like overthink it. Yeah. I guess I, 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 I was looking at some of your, your photographs and I, and I just feel they felt very purposeful, very meticulously planned. You know, I felt like you were taking a lot of care, whereas I think you have a little bit more freedom. I don't want to say fix it in post, but you have a little bit more leeway, you know, if, if you're capturing something on video and you're just not getting it right to sort of shift into the this, shift into the right spot, shift into the right frame, shift into it and sort of fix it, where when you're taking a picture and you might take 50 pictures to get one that you like, but I just felt that that from looking at just a, a limited amount of it, that it felt like you were really, you, there was, there was, there was a lot of passion behind it. I don't know if you would agree. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, hmm. I don't know. I think, um, I don't know. I sometimes, well, okay. So I don't know if this totally answers your question, but so it's, it's always weird to see, not weird, but um, it's always interesting to watch like a photographer try and do video and then a videographer try and do photos. I think sometimes there's like this strange disconnect um, that happens because, you know, video requires time and motion and that's just not really present in photography. And so sometimes you see photographers try and do video and the way that they shoot video is a lot like the way that they do photography. And, and, and so their camera work is a lot more um, static. It's on tripod. It feels very like composed and lifeless. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't really, I, I definitely prefer video, but um, photography just is, I, th uh, I think a lot faster of a medium sometimes. I think the, the other thing that sort of connects them for me is the post-production aspects becoming so similar because, you know, it basically Premiere now lets you uh, edit your video like you were editing a photograph, you know, by adding this or that. And, and it's sort of, they've sort of uh, brought together the two skill sets because you needed to have a certain skill sets to, to Photoshop and, and do post-production on a picture. And you needed different skills to do post-production on a video, which you still need in terms of timing, pacing, adding music. But 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 in terms of the visuals, your workflow is very similar in terms of I'm going to color correct this, and and the tools the tools are similar. You know, the, there's all all the Photoshop tools are inside of Premiere and vice versa. Now it feels like. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess that just kind of speaks to uh, the similarities of the medium. Just that, you know, color, balance, composition, all of that is still at play. Absolutely. Kurt says, uh, I can definitely use her on some piano or saxophone stuff. He's always looking to build your band. He's got a, his island is of misfit musicians. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that'd be fun. Yeah. Right. Another outlet to try, right? An another outlet. You know, you, you could put out a, you could go after Kenny G. <laughs> yeah. Angela W. on the sax, coming after that Kenny G money. <laughs> um also your your um you know you're picking a field that's male dominated obviously you know uh, photographers although i mean any Leibowitz, there's a billion you know top flight uh, female photographers out there in terms of dps um you you unfortunately for the the, the vast majority of the history of simina weren't there over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, there's been some that have distinguished themselves as directors, DPs. Obviously, uh, the Alec Baldwin tragedy uh, recently took one away. Um, did you uh, 
did you get any any backlash, feedback, advice from your family, friends in terms of when you wanted to go full four into that, or was your mind made up that that you were going to kind of jump in with with both feet? Yeah, I'm pretty stubborn, so I was definitely you know just not listening to anyone and and just going forward with it um, regardless. In terms of like sexism, yeah. It's definitely there. Um, and, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm I'm maybe overcompensating or um, trying to be just as tough as the guys. But it's just, you know, it's kind of pointless. Time, well, not pointless, but times are changing. So it's um, definitely getting better for women in the workplace. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to represent. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find that, that uh, I mean, and how does that present itself? Does it present itself in like... In like sometimes it's you know most of the time so far it's been pretty subtle it's sometimes dealing with um you know certain people who are older um and are kind of stuck in their ways of thinking about things or they just don't realize that it's you know sexist or rude to say that um a particular comment um so i mean you know i try to address it sometimes but other times you just i don't know just got to let it go and push on through with uh, with the work. Pick your battles type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I mean, in terms of, um, I think that the way I've seen it presented is sort of the hierarchy on set, which is a director should only be listening to the DP. The DP should only be looking, you know, basically paying attention to what the director does and um, or pay attention to like their lighting and rigging crew if they have suggestions about stuff like that. But I even find that with, you know, with, with our crews, some people have that tendency to want to butt in and say, you might want to move that uh, an inch to your left or a little bit to the right, or have you thought about that light over there or this and that? So I can imagine that, that, that they might, it might be as subtle as that or as blatant as like, Oh, hell yeah, I'll help you move the camera little lady or like, so, you know, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what you're coming up against, but I, I do, I do understand that, it, that, that, that you're, that you're getting through it, which is good. Um, in terms of uh, influences, I know you, you, you talked a little bit about like uh, Michael Moore and, you know, cinema, uh, the, uh, well said. the, did you, uh, was there a movie or a type of movie or a genre that you obsessed over when you were younger? You know, I always ask people like, what was the, what's the first movie that you just pop into the VCR DVD player over and over, or just kind of can always rewatch. God. Um, well, so for a long time, I, I wanted to do narrative fiction films, but um, uh, it wasn't until college I had a film analysis class and they showed us a clip from high school, which is a cinema verite documentary um, about a high school in like the 1950s. And the way that it was shot felt like a film. So there was, you know, tight close ups on faces and reactions um, and still telling a story visually, not like in a boring PBS kind of dated documentary style. And it just it just blew me away. So ever since then, I've been I've been hooked on Verite documentary in particular. Um, I just I just love that type of work. It's um it's it's like this fine balance between um, reality and also finding like the artful moments in it. Okay, I can I can see that. Besides Michael Moore, are there any other documentary filmmakers that you gravitate to, like Oppenheimer or, or somebody? Or, yeah. Or <clears throat> Oppenheimer, um, uh, The Act of Killing is fantastic. Uh, Bombay Beach, um, also really uh, influential for me. Um, yeah, and then the other filmmaker, so this goes back into narrative, but um, Andrea Arnold, she does um, fiction work, but it feels very much like documentary. Um, for her film Fish Tank, she used uh, in just a total amateur teenage girl off the street who just had like the right energy and the right um, attitude. So she cast her as like the main character. And a lot of it was a lot of hand, uh, shaky handheld camera work. It was um, just really beautiful, intense close-ups. And she still managed to pull like a really great performance out of a total amateur, which I thought was incredible. 
Yeah, Oppenheimer is a beast, and the act of killing and the look of silence, the follow up was also impactful. Although I didn't, I, I don't think that any follow up to the act of killing could be could be as impactful because that's one of literally one of the you know I think for me the act of killing, Basketball Diaries, Grizzly Man, um, the two the two Escobars, and um, and probably, um, man, I don't know. Uh, there's, there's, there, the, my fifth favorite doc probably, probably changes within those. But, but, I, but Cartel Land probably another one that I, that I really, really enjoy. Uh, Kurt says Dark Days with a pretty uh, epic, pretty deep dive. What was? Uh, I don't know if I remember seeing that, uh, but I'll definitely check it out. Um, do you? One of the things that I wanted to talk about in in one of my future Ed Wood film episodes was the uh, like the Dogma '95 sort of movement, in turn, which is similar to the uh, you know Cinema Verita sort of style, which is you know no sound unless it's you know at the place, no bringing of no props unless it's there, no no this, no that, no professional actors. This yeah, all this one other light stuff. at most. One yeah. light at most, uh, stuff like that, and. I don't know. It felt that when I was, because because our our beginnings as a, you could say that we started off sort of more mumblecore, which is I think is is a little bit is similar to Dogma, uh, but not necessarily the same thing. And uh, then, um, give me a second. I gotta go hold my dad a second. Um, the Dogma ninety five, the the similar that these film styles. Do you find that? That is, it is important because I think sometimes you'll be doing something, especially when you're a young filmmaker, you're starting off, you'll be doing something even as an artist and somebody will come to you that's more experienced and is like, well, you're just doing cubism. You know, you're, you're drawing something and you're just you're just doing Picasso. You're doing cubism. Well, just because Picasso was the best at cubism doesn't mean that I can't also do cubism or there you're like, oh, I want to do this documentary and I kind of just want to get this natural stuff. Light. And they're like, well, you're just doing cinema or, you know, so I think it's the same thing, right? Whether you start doing something, a certain style, and then you realize, hey, other people have done this or if you learn about a style of filmmaking and they say, I want to do this. Do you feel that both of them are sort of getting to that position, getting to that artistic point the same way? Mm, maybe no. <laughs> Cause I feel like um, dog went, was it 95 or 65? I forget. 95. 95. 95. So I think they have like a really um, sort of semi-political angle towards what they're doing, um, which I, actually really like um because i know one of the things is they don't really have a quote-unquote director um they right. just kind of uh openly embrace the I'll idea call, that, call that yeah <laughs> openly embrace the idea that um you know the whole crew makes this film and, and puts it together which i think is fantastic uh well here let's take a look at some of the dogma 95 rules the dogma 95 shooting must be done on location the sound must never be produced apart from the image or vice versa, meaning no soundtrack. Um, the camera must be handheld. The film must be in color. Optical work and filters are forbidden. All right. That seems a bit extensive. Uh, the film uh, must be Academy 35 millimeter. The director must not be credited. Ooh. Uh, I mean, how does that I, feel? <laughs> I don't know if uh, to me it feels a little bit like like you're trying to be a little too cool for school. It, it just starts mm -hmm. to feel a little. It starts to feel a little pretentious at some point because because I feel like film should be more accessible. And 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 this is this is from the late '90s, uh, so obviously maybe it was in response to because if you were able to do all that, shoot on thirty-five. If you were able to shoot on 35 in the late 90s, you had a little money, you know, because it was hard to it was hard to, to to shoot on 35 millimeter. Nowadays, I don't think it would make sense because one of the best things about filmmaking in the 2010s and plus is DSLR cameras that sort of narrowed the playing field or even the playing field for for filmmakers. So I think that I, I even though I understand the 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 goal of making the film pure from a cinematic standpoint, 
I do like film to be more inclusive rather than exclusive, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't Absolutely. know. Like to me, it it doesn't feel super exclusive. I I think the well, the thirty five millimeter part does sound exclusive, but a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, but yeah, some of the other other aspects of it feels more purist. Yeah, which that I'm into. Um, I don't know. I, gotta... yeah, I mean, with with DSLRs, man, that stuff changed the game. I'm a giant narcissist. You can't tell me I can't be accredited as a director. That's the whole, the whole, the whole reason I'm doing this is for the written and directed by Luis Martinez. That's 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 what I live for, man. I can't. You, you can tell me. Oh, also the direct. Fuck all that. I'm getting my credit. I'm sorry. I should. I should, I should be. At least, at least you're open about it, and you're, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, and and that you credit your crew and don't just try and take over and uh, take all the credit. <laughs> Have you, um, what position, do you feel more comfortable in a position as a DP um, to sort of bring somebody's vision to life and to work with a director? Or do you feel more comfortable in a dual role, uh, having final decision on, on, on what something's going to look like? Um, I can, I feel more comfortable either as uh, just a director or um, that dual role. Um, I find that, you know, just because of the nature of the work that I've done all these past couple of years, um, I've had to kind of just take on both roles and, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's created a very like, uh, scrappy, um, one man band kind of, uh, mentality. Um, so I, you know, for me, it's the goal right now is to really learn how to work with a crew and, uh, work as a team. Do you have, uh, like your, your go-to crew? in terms of like who you work with? Yeah, so um, currently we're, I'm, I'm like editing a documentary and we have a team um, that is pretty young, but also really talented. And sometimes I'll hire them for my own freelance gigs. Um, and so I'm learning to, you know, just work with them, you know, tell them this is what I'm thinking for, you know, maybe my freelance clients, this is what I'm thinking, help me out with lighting, help me out with camera angles. Um, but, you know, this is just the general idea of what I want. So it's it's been uh, it's been a learning curve, but it's been good. All right, absolutely. We're live talking with Angela Wong, filmmaker, photographer, crypto and coffee enthusiast. <laughs> We're gonna get to that. Make sure that if you guys uh, are watching, you leave a like on the stream. Also, check out buydogecoincoffee.com. dot We uh, the the stream has a coffee uh sponsor mestizo coffee but uh this week we're talking about dogecoin coffee they accept crypto so if you have been holding for the last several years or you uh did you see the thing where people that invested uh each of their uh each of their stimulus checks into doge made like three or four hundred grand or something like oh that that was, that was like there's some, some some crypto kids they're like oh i don't need my Twelve hundred dollars from the government. I'm just going to buy a bunch of Doge. And, oh, uh, I wish I had done that. <laughs> hopefully they, hopefully they got out at seven to seven and not at like twenty four. Uh, but yeah. uh, we're uh, we're gonna we're gonna. We, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. I need uh, we need to take a quick uh, thirty to sixty second break. Real quick, I got to go help my dad with something. Uh, but we are going to be talking live here with Angela for a while. We're going to talk about uh, her dive into crypto, about Dogecoin Coffee, uh, about NFTs, about more about her career. Uh, so st st hang out. I'll be back in less than 90 seconds and we'll keep going. I'll be right back. Angela. Sounds good. Yep. Told you it would be quick. 
Uh, we're live here with Angela Wong. Uh, you guys can find out more about her at Angela Wong. A, A Wong Films.com, where you can check out some of her work in uh, reels, testimonials, uh, equipment. It's very uh, business video. Now, I know you were doing like soulless corporate work, but you're still doing semi corporate work where you get to pick your clients. Now, how, I mean, because the thing about just corporate videos is that you can, you can, you can make money off of it. You can, you can work in corporate films, corporate videos, training videos, etc. You can make good change if you get a nice client that'll come back for you, or even you can get an in-house gig, uh, busting out content. But I always call it soulless corporate work because there is there is this pain that goes into putting creative effort into you know capitalistic sort of work uh, do you feel that that's easier for you when you're sort of picking your clients and working with people whose whose products you respect and it, did, do you did you feel sort of stuck before you you were able to do that yeah so I worked in real estate video a lot. Um, for a couple of years. And honestly, that was like when I was most depressed because, um, you know, you were just helping people make tons of money and they, <laughs> you know, like didn't respect you. It was just, uh, it was just the most awful situation. And I was like, I did not get into filmmaking for this, you know? Um, so fortunately, you know, also because of COVID and the lockdown and the whole pandemic shakeup thing, um, I was able to, you know, get a new job, where, you know, double down on my freelance work, but also get a new part-time gig where I'm editing a documentary. So it's, it's definitely like, you know, much better work, but you know, then the pay isn't as great. So I don't know. It's, it's just kind of a balance and you try and make it work with the, uh, with everything you got. Yeah. Somebody who I talked about wanting to make films for several years, you know, and um, wasn't really doing much. And then fine, because and part of the reason I wasn't making movies was because I was working 70, 80 hours a week at a job that I was really, really good at. That was very, very easy to me. And I was like in the top one to five percent of the people doing this job. I was making almost six figures a year and in and, and, and a comfortable sort of lifestyle. But I was not doing anything that I was passionate about. And my roommate and my partner, Brian, was uh, doing basically the same thing that I was in San Francisco. And he was working a job that was making him money, but he was a writer and he wasn't writing. And he said, dude, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to stay on your couch for a few months. And we're gonna just and we're gonna and we're gonna make a movie. Oh, and I cool. was like and I was like and that was that was it. From then from from then on, that was eleven that was probably eleven years ago when it happened because we've been in we've been in production for ten years. And that was the moment where I stopped talking about it and actually said, Well, you know what? Once he was there, I was like, Well, I'm gonna go from working seventy five hours a week and I quit that job and I went to work at a company where I could work thirty hours a week. Uh, of course, I was making half of what I was making, uh, but I was able to spend the rest of that time uh, in pre-production and producing and, and, and taking days off to be able to do that. So I think it's, it's about balance. I think that people, there's people that can, that can stifle their dreams or their passions and those people are sensible, right? That's what your, that's what your family says. Well, just, yeah, if you got a good job, it's making you money, like fuck your dreams, right? Is that... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> is that the is that the mentality? Mm, no, absolutely not. I think I think sometimes you just get stuck. I for a long time um, just felt so stuck, and it. But you you see the check coming in, and so you're just like, all right, fine, whatever. All right, all right, all right, and then all, right. all of a sudden, you know, years pass, and you're like, holy shit, what have I been doing? You know, this is not what I signed up for. Um, because you know, I. I, I believe that, you know, film can make a difference and, and to just be, you know, like, look at my house, 
buy it for seven million and I get like twenty percent of it or whatever, or even just five percent, whatever. It's it yeah yeah that's that's super tough. No, I I completely understand. I'm glad that you're doing. I'm I'm glad that 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 you came out of this pandemic, or we're still sort of hopefully in the endemic stage. Mm-hmm. Um, I I hope you're. The, I'm glad that you came out of it uh, more fulfilled in your work. Uh, number one, absolutely. Um, now, start to finish is the name of your production company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that's it's a very common sort of. There's a similar phrase in business called birth to death, which is from the start of the project till it leaves your hands and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What, how, why is that, um, why is that important to corporate clients as opposed to hiring individual people for, for each, each start of a video? Um, I think sometimes when you, you know, take on clients, they don't really understand the production process and, you know, unless, I think, I think for me, the learning curve with that was learning to educate them as well and walk them through the entire process. And the fact that, you know, me and my team, we can handle it from start to finish is, uh, is really beneficial for them. Cause you know, then you don't have to like go to this person just to shoot and then go to this person just to edit and go to that person for a voiceover. And it's like, well, we can handle all of that for you. One stop shop. Yep. Yeah, I think I think YouTube kind of like changed it. YouTube technology, DSLRs, whatever you want to, you know, point the finger at. But, you know, I think it's it's kind of forced us to not just do one thing and and to just kind of be all around creatives. I mean, you know, you see YouTube influencers who are really incredible videographers, editors, storytellers. I mean, they they pretty much handle it all. But now they get to a point where they're able to hire other people to help them. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, it's funny. The you know we're sitting here struggling to try to get stuff made, projects to make our own films, and then these influencers get a billion followers off of a thirty second clip that they it's horribly edited, but they doing a they're, they're doing a cool little dance and we just got to fill some titties. That's all. <laughs> and then, well, it comes for a circle because they get to the point where they're so busy where they're like, well, I, I need a real film editor now. And then it's, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. It's kind of a full circle from like soulless corporate work to soulless TikTok edits. But you are right that a lot of these uh, TikTokers, uh, YouTubers, they, they, the concept of storytelling is universal. Um, so, the, even though horizontal video is is I think one of the uh, one of the the most painful parts of of the modernization of filmmaking, um, but the the element sometimes I'm impressed by some of the edits because it's not like super fancy. They cut on motion. They 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 get creative with their things and and you can't really hate on them. Even though other than the fact that. Man, I learned my craft. I spent hours figuring out how to edit, slicing, and and you edit, and you make an edit in minute seven, but you have to watch it from the beginning just to see how that cut works with the rest of the flow of the film. So you end up watching this, this short or this thing that you're making like a million times, and these guys edit it on their phone in 30 seconds. Boop, 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 boop. Add a little, uh, add a little graphics, effects, boom, boom, boom. They put it out there. <laughs> and let the let the dopamine of likes flow, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it just sounds similar to um, you know, like boomers complaining about young kids for taking shortcuts or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that was my boomer moment right there. I guess. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, lose a boomer. Um, oh, yeah. Called. Yeah. Hey, please. <laughs> this is what we're all about. We gotta. We gotta crack our own. We gotta call ourselves out because yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, but I did start with a nice that the, the the elements of the film is there. The elements of storytelling, the the angles, the stuff. I think it's I, I think some of the stuff where people do conversations with themselves and they play t- multiple characters. I think some of that's brilliant. I'm just like that's so simple. It's so it's so it's mm-hmm. so stuff. It's it goes against everything that I've learned about filmmaking, but it works. And if you have an audience that's not watching, that's not going to the movies two or three times a week, that's not sitting in front of a big screen, that's more on their phone, then then you got to know the audience and and kind of uh, growth is growth right recognition is recognition yeah have you seen your um your work change or your style change or be influenced by youtubers 
Uh, other than the thumbnails that I'm trying to make better. Uh, <laughs> I think that... By the way, my uh, thumbnail was fire. I just want to say thank you again for that. that, that pretty, it's that, pretty dope. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. You gave me some good stuff to work with. I, I really like that picture. I'm like, I got to get the, I got to get the bike in there. Um, you know, I, I, I try to, I think what I've done is I've incorporated YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat as something that my characters are doing. So I think that I've, I think that that's where I've sort of added the, you know, in, in one of my pilots, there's a, some something happens to a guy and then it's like hey it just got posted on world star or there's a girl in, in in that same thing that she's like always on snapchat during the video or something <laughs> like that and i've sort of sort of integrated them into the reality of the two yam burrito universe i don't know i don't think that i've changed my style i think that i consume a lot of content so i can't really talk shit about content creators because i watch poker content creators filmmakers i watch a lot of stuff and besides the podcast and the stream i also started to create some uh content for filmmakers that i want to see and i and 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 people have been telling me for the last year or two that i need to um to have a tiktok presence um so i have can you do started. the dances? <laughs> I can't do the dances. I am not a fabulous uh, young gay boy or girl, and they, they're, they're so fabulous, and they're out there, and, like, I just, I, I love that they're so, I just, I, I love about TikTok is that people are being themselves while pretending to be somebody else because they're, <laughs> they're really, like, these, these, these guys are just out there, and they're just, like, fucking all, it takes a lot of balls to set your phone on in a public place and then back away from it while people are walking by and you, you're just going like, Ooh, and you just start <laughs> like that takes so much courage. Uh -huh. That takes, that takes that. That's like literally dancing. Like nobody's watching when everybody's watching. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I know influencers in the wild gives them a lot of shit and, 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 and there is a certain level of narcissism. And, but again, I'm a narcissist, so I can't knock them on that. Um, there well, is okay, a what about just vlogging? You can vlog on set real fast. Well, maybe not on set because yeah. there's plenty going yeah. on. I, on. On my Instagram, I'll always vlog on set. I'll say, hey, this is what's going on. We're shooting here. Mm -hmm. I'm here shooting this. I, I do I do like to – I do believe that a director's vlog is something that I like doing, and, and I've always sort of wanted to do that. But I also want – I also think that even though I'm long-winded, if I can keep – if I can break down some of my takes into smaller size tidbits – like I have a list like, uh, you know, like I, I wanted to do a full video about um, whether you should start your movie with somebody waking up in the morning because that's such a indie film cliche. Why is it such an indie film cliche? Because most it, filmmakers, when they're starting off, have access to their bedroom. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have access to like a stage or something like that. So, all right, we'll shoot the first scene in my bedroom and I'm waking up in the morning and this and that. And it sort of jumps into a character. But it is something that other filmmakers shit on because it's the cliche of the alarm clock going off in the morning and the person waking up and, and you're bringing them into your day. So I have a whole take about that. So the question is, can I bring that down to what is TikTok's uh, limit now? Like 90 seconds, right? Or I don't know what, what their, their max time is, but can I, can I get that take out in 90 seconds? Can I put it up on TikTok? And would that drive people to watch some of my kind of longer sort of form stuff. Hmm. That's that's kind of where I'm at in terms of whether or not I want to steer into that curve all the way. Because I think it would be easier to, I just feel, I don't know, I, I feel that TikTok would be good for 2M Burrito in terms of putting, or I don't know, the other thing I thought is, well, what if I just put little short scenes from my movies up, mm -hmm. right? Out of context. And I was like, uh, so I think what I'm leaning towards is some tips for filmmakers that I can use and then try to drive the people that watch those things back towards my main stuff so they can see short films that I've made, other interviews that I've done, and things like that. Hmm. So that sounds like a good plan. Sounds like a good plan. But since I'm a boomer, you know, I don't I, I don't I don't know. I I I'm afraid that if I sign up and I put that I'm 44 in the terms of service, they're gonna be like, ah, sorry. <laughs> You are twenty. You are twenty years older than the youngest tick than the oldest TikToker. The, the oldest TikToker on Earth is twenty four years old, and you're twenty years past that. So no, but I do see like, 
I think it's funny where I see like older celebrities, like sports people and other stuff that are like, you can also find me on TikTok now. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you're trying you to you get lose 12, your respect for them. You're trying to get 12 year olds to come follow you. I guess they want, they do watch a lot of videos, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's really funny is um, the whole financial sector has just been, um, you know, usually you think of it as like a bunch of older white guys in suits controlling like millions and trillions of dollars. And now it's like 12 year olds on TikTok giving financial advice. And they're like, I, you know, YOLO'd into Doge and now I made like 15,000. And you're just like, wow, that took 15,000. Like that takes me like several months to make, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to YOLO into Doge when you're, <laughs> when you're, when you, when, you, when, when you're 12, you, when you're 12 and you got a roof over your head and nothing's happening. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it's harder to YOLO into Dodge when you're in your 30s and you're like, oh, excuse me, should I YOLO into Dodge or should I pay my mortgage? I don't know. <laughs> and then I've, Doge been there. Go I've been in that. I've been in that situation. Hey, you, you never know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the about Do uh, by Doge about by Doge Coffee. When did, where did that idea come from? Um, so I've been trying, you know, several entrepreneurial side hustles and uh, and this was one of them a friend of mine he has his own um iron wolf coffee and um and he was like this is the process you know and it's pretty simple <laughs> you know uh find a roaster design the bag and and make the website and just you know salesman it all day long and uh and i just really i'm a huge fan of crypto you know it for it fits my pseudo political agenda um you know, like down with the government and, you know, take back your power, all that, all that jazz. So um, I, I was like, oh, well, maybe, you know, we can get Doge people to be into it and, and buy some coffee and, and actually use their Doge coin and not just like hold it forever, you know, because that's part of um, creating a, an economy that actually uses the crypto. That you got all that learning from all them hippies up in Ithaca. I, I know them. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, I um I had a video producer. One of my first jobs out here. He's the one who got me into it. So Californian hippies, they're much more hardcore. They're much more, yeah. I know, but they, if you're gonna be a hippie, uh, and hippies usually are like you know fuck these New York winners. I got that. Fuck all that going out there. Um, and then you you had a special offer for for anybody that that uses the the two M burrito. What was it you told me? And I forgot. Correct. Um, so if you order a bag of coffee, um, and type in the code two AM burrito, uh, we'll include one of those physical Doge coins, the the little gold plated ones. One of these bad boys. Yep. Yep. Ooh. Those are that, pretty I'm... fun. I have I have one on my desk. I should bring okay. one to work too. That uh, that would look pretty cool up there on my on my mantle. I'm just saying. Heck yeah. So I might I might have to I might have to cut myself a bag of coffee. And you are taking Doge as payment. Yes. Yep. Do you think that's, that's the? Through, sorry. That's right, done no, no, through a, a Coinbase Commerce. So um, if you're so if you... you know kind of new to it, there's a there's a little bit of a learning curve, but um, basically if you have Doge Coin on your Coinbase account, you just um, you do like a, a sending address and then you attach it to the wallet. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I, I, I'm in, I'm in Coinbase because um, crypto is really big for pokey, poker, poking, poker and uh, gambling, stuff like that, that. Ooh, are you good of... at um, poker? Yes. Yes. My... Really good. Okay. My my goal is to be the first person to win an Oscar and a World Series of Poker bracelet. But, Very cool. Yeah, I you, admire do you, that. Do you dabble in the in the in the cards? I've tried to learn, but I just never commit. <laughs> uh, well, if you get a chance, uh, the interview that I did last week with Andrew Nimi, he's a poker vlogger who has one hundred and eighty thousand subscribers on YouTube. He's one of the mm -hmm. OG. He's one of the OG poker vloggers. He has a uh, Andrew Nimi. He's got a um, he's got a really cool style of sort of breaking down um, poker for for people, sort of making it more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would say check out our interview or check out his his vlog. He's really cool stuff. Cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Hey, it's not a goal unless you write it down or say it out loud, right, Angela? And yeah. I want I want them to put that on my tombstone fifty years from now. 
<laughs> First man to ever win a World Series of Poker bracelet and an Oscar. Although I like that. Know. Man with ambition. No, is it? Oh, hey, wait a second. I might have to hold on a second here. I'm looking at some coffee here. I might have to get this breakfast blend because that's when I drink my coffee is in the morning. And then this cute guy, that's the official mascot. Yeah, that's my dog, <laughs> Echo. <laughs> I know. I always see you taking pictures of him. <laughs> he's an older, he, is he an older guy, right? Yep. Yep. He's 11. Oh, man. Well, she. My, she's 11. She's 11, okay. yeah. Okay, cool. My dogs are in the 10, 11, and then I decided to get a puppy, uh, which was Ooh. which was fun. Where? Where is it? They're back here. They're they're roaming. They're roaming. I let them run around. You can see Shy Girl in the back right there. That's my yeah. that's my female pit. And then the other one's further up on the bed, and the other one's roaming around being an asshole uh, because he's a he's a German Shepherd and he thinks he rules shit. Um, from from crypto, the last couple of years, and I did a bit about it when we started about my, my I I like my tokens non fungible. Um, NFTs to normal people. Not going to say normal people to boomers and to people that are not sort of deep in the crypto streets or that haven't really that just feel like, you know, it's a mean these are meme coins and stuff like that. It it sort of feels weird when you when you try to explain an NFT to somebody and you have to tell them, well, it's it's the digital rights to an image. And uh, and yes, anybody can right click and save that image, but you are the only one that. Ho that owns the the rights to it so if you make money off of it you can sell it and then these become like commodities uh basically it's the concept of of rare art in digital form um then it got expanded then they, then they, then then they get exp then the way i think people can understand it the most is it's basically a contract right it's a contract that ties you to the ownership of of, of an entity and if that entity becomes more valuable, then you can then sell it or license it or do things like that. But it doesn't. But but do you? Was there a learning curve for you where that? Was there a point where you finally understood them, or did you kind of get get what what they were from the beginning? Um, definitely a learning curve. Honestly, the whole industry has just taken off so much that it's it's no longer just buy this coin and hold it and hope the value goes up. Now there's like so many more um use cases for it um for example uh you know there are there are you know countries where women are pretty much still i, I don't know if you want to use the term slaves to men but um they're very much tied to their husbands and they can't have their own bank account but now because of crypto you can actually they can actually open their own um crypto wallets and then you know start a side business and make their own money instead of being, you know, completely dependent on the, on the man. Um, and then there's also like, if you get into DeFi, which is kind of creating like an entire financial um, economy outside of an established bank, which is actually really exciting. Um, there are like people far smarter than me who are, you know, working on this and, and giving it practical use cases. I'm still very much just dabbling and learning, um, and I try and teach people what what I do know. And uh, in terms of NFTs, you can um, also use them. It's not just the rights to the image, but also using them in the metaverse. So, um, uh, for example, Decentraland, uh, Nike is buying up land in there. Um, they've already, you know, built um, like a little store where your avatar can like walk around you can buy a pair of the nft shoes if you want and then put it on your avatar so as we build out these metaverses um we're able to have entire lives out onto you know this infinite metaverse and you know dress it the way we want present ourselves in the way we want kind of like real life but you know maybe sillier hmm. well I, I i think that the people get stuck on the on 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 the value portion of it where they're like okay again you know uh there was wait there was a something that i saw which was uh, a guy had created an art piece uh which was they took a bunch of uh, a bunch of um a bunch of i don't know if it were crypto punks or or bored apes or something but they took an entire collection and they made a nft of just them right clicking on a bunch of <laughs> NFTs <laughs> and 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 saving those and then put those all together to create an image of a and then make that as an NFT. It was like the right click NFT, which I thought was hilarious because I think 
when you say you can you you can you can be the only person that's allowed to use this as your avatar, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then and somebody else can be like, well, I'm just gonna save it on my desktop and then I can use it as an avatar. Do you it, does that mean that at some point that will be policed? Do you feel like that um, that for this for the market to to stay sort of legitimate that that eventually it has to be enforced some way? Okay, two things. One, this just kind of reminds me of like Dadaism or Dada art, right? Where it's like, here's a toilet in the museum. <laughs> right, just in the middle, just um, sitting there. Yeah, exactly. But um, no, the idea of non-fungible tokens is, you know, you own the right to that. So like, even though somebody else right clicked it, they're not going to be able to use it in the metaverse because you're the only one tied to it. Okay. So whether so even though you can save it on your laptop and 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 like like for example let's say let's say the picture of you on that bike was an NFT right mm -hmm. but I wanted to use that and modify it to make the thumbnail for our talk right so in the I real think, world I think if you once you modify it and you like put it onto the blockchain you're able to use it but if it's okay. like that original image and I own it that's technically mine I would need to either pay you or get permission from you to use it. Yeah. Yeah. We can negotiate on Doge. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I accept Doge, just like coffee. Okay, so um, I've been in the crypto streets for a little bit. Um, you know, uh, just like I said, because of my involvement in poker and, and, and other nefarious activities that are <laughs> easier to manage. I used I, I I was I was an artist for a long time. I, I I have books of sketches that I think are really good. I've exhibited in I have a, a a picture here that I exhibited in a museum. I I, I draw Ooh. certain. I, I see you can, you can see it up there. See that that's a that's that's a picture that I drew. Uh, okay, that's just cool. a sketch. Um, and and then I know a lot of like comic book artists and. And and just other visual artists that that create physical art. This what is what is the step that the, that people like that need to take to take art that they've created that has just been consumed by themselves and they've shown to people and convert that to to an NFT to a property. Other than the technical aspect of taking a a, a high quality photograph of it putting it i guess opening up an open c wallet or, or a coinbase account or something to tie it to there what is the physical what are the steps that somebody has to do for that i mean that yeah that's that's basically it um then it just goes kind of back to basic marketing skills of marketing your art marketing your um your uh open c wallet um but yeah i mean that's basically it i think um take a photo take a high quality photo scan your art um, I mean, this is a really great time to just put your art out there and, and see if the world is interested in buying it, you know? So what should I do first? Should I uh, NFT my artwork or should I TikTok my film contact? I, <laughs> I, would, I would do the NFT first. <laughs> <laughs> Because once that's set up, you can just let it go. But you know, your TikTok, you're going to be managing. So you, you, you. So the the NFT market is sort of based on the metaverse. The metaverse is coming. The metaverse <laughs> yeah. coming, and 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 people wanting to own the own pieces of this digital landscape, kind of like people buy mm -hmm. up real estate now, right? Yeah, or um, art, you know, like paintings. I mean, Vogue, Vogue magazine was in there recently, too. They just put out like three pieces of um, art that are, I mean, they're beautiful photographs, but, you know, they're just a photo. <laughs> and that um, that sold, sold pretty high up on there, too. Now, here's a question. Let's say somebody makes an NFT, because you can find a picture of the Mona Lisa anywhere on the Internet, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somebody in the Louvre owns the Mona Lisa or it was donated to them and they, and they have it. And, and you can go to Paris and you can see it on the wall behind six inches of thick ass glass and behind a barrier um so they own it and if they weren't going to sell it it would be probably a billion dollars that 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 painting would cost right it, it, mm -hmm. it's a price it's a priceless piece of artwork if they if they created an nft of the mona lisa would it be as valuable to be the one person that could use the mona lisa avatar or or do you feel that that established physical art 
um, is going to continue to have more value than the digital copy of that same art? Damn, that's a really good question. I don't know. Let me I write don't that know time down. <laughs> I, I 104. Was, 104. When I when I, I got I put I put all those together in a in a compilation because it, it feeds my ego every time somebody says that's a good question. My hack grows one size too big. <laughs> I should do that. I should just make um, <laughs> montages of stuff that makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, you got to You got to do. You got to feed. The, you got to feed the monkey, man. You got to get it. Yeah, I I I don't know about that one. I mean, would Da Vinci get the money? I guess for the Mona Lisa. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, would, I mean, could the Louvre uh, basically put out a Mona Lisa NFT and raise money for charity, you know, and 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 say we're going to put, even though we're going to keep the original, it's always going to be here in the museum because we want the physical copy. We will create an NFT of this, put it out there for the metaverse, sell it for like a million Ethereum, <laughs> and then you know solve the hunger problem. I don't know. I'm just wondering, like, how far how far down the rabbit hole does this go? You know, that's a really, again, that's a really good question. So that's 105. <laughs> 105. Uh, yeah, time, time stamp that. Mm -hmm. As they um, say on the Twitch street, clip that. Gosh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, part of it, though, is just crypto is just such a silly industry. So I think that um, I think it's just it should be really accessible to people to just go and fuck around and try things out. Fuck around if find you, out. If you want to try, if you want to try and just put the Mona Lisa on as an NFT, I'd be curious to see what happens. I mean, maybe you'll be an overnight Ethereum billionaire, you know? Boom, boom, boom. I think that 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 a lot of that is kind of why people are sort of apprehensive to dip their toes in because they they don't they don't see it as like an established market, but a new growing one. So I think a lot of young people are like like my nephew's knee deep into uh into like nfts and creating them and he's in oh, the chat cool. rooms about it and he's in he's in you should have him to, on the show too yeah we're, I, I am gonna have him on he's a young kid but he, and he really really like is into it and he he's on this uh, on these discord servers and i joined them and they I immediately start getting bombarded with like hey you should check this this board apes and uh, yep. chill, chill monkeys, and mm -hmm. you know, out of out of work cigarette butts that yeah. have anthropomorphical faces, and and you know, teddy bears oh. with guns, and I'm like, wow, there is so <laughs> much, there's so much stuff out there. Um, so my question is always like, how do physical artists that are like comic book artists, uh, you know, go in there? And then the follow up question is, if you spend money on an NFT, let's say, let's say for you know. Let's say we do a, you know, I do an NFT of, of, of uh, you know, just anything, just my one of my dogs. But then, okay, and I sell that and it's popular. Then I sell one of my dog, but this time he's got a cigarette in his mouth. And then the next one, he's got an eye patch. And it's, you know, and the next thing is that. So I, one of the things that I'm always curious about is how many versions of this board ape or this crypto punk are there going to be and does that diminish the value of the original ones if you just if you're just i don't know if i don't know if it's greed by the creators that could create like an overflow and a crash in the market or if that's just the natural evolution of these things and the originals are still going to keep sort of their value i guess they keep their value i think people look at them as more like unique little avatars you know um each one is supposed to be distinct it's it's a weird world. I'm not gonna lie. It's yeah. it's very strange. Um, honestly, I don't fully understand it, but I enjoy it. It's a lot of fun, and uh, and I can't wait to see what your nephew says. <laughs> no, I definitely wanna I definitely wanna get the 18 year old's perspective. But like I said, once I once I was doing my research, I'm like, oh, okay, Angela's over here in these. Uh, she's in these crypto streets. She's over here in the NFT. She's selling her. She's she's on it. And I just sort of felt like it would be cool to to have a conversation uh, mm -hmm. about it from like a perspective. And this is mm -hmm. your page here for 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 NFTs, right? Yep. Yeah. If anybody wants to buy them, have at it. <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> have um, some of them I purchased. This one I made. This one okay. actually I made in um, After Effects. Okay. So that's just do, my doggy. <laughs> do they do they do they have to move or can they be still images or is it just kind of a preference? Um, it's just kind of a preference. I thought um, so. I I put out some still images as well, but um, I just wanted to try the three D ones. So there's that that one that's kind of three D ish. Um, 
with the blue and the pink. I don't this know one? if you can yeah, that one. That one I purchased. Um, it's like got interesting elements of stillness, but also animation. Okay. So it's I don't know, I just thought it was fun. So I bought it. <laughs> Right, and you, know, you bought it for you know it's worth uh, 0 0.01 right now, but it could be worth 2.3 later on or something. And you're the only person that gets to do that gets to use this, right? Correct. Yeah. Pay no attention to what I'm doing here. What? Hold on. Hold on a second. No, hold on a second. No, don't worry. About, don't worry about what I'm doing over here. Don't worry about it. Pay no attention to my mouse over here. I'm just kidding. Um. No, I, I and then the other thing that's interesting, um, and before we get off this topic, because because we were talking to Angela Wong about her life as a filmmaker, her life in crypto by Doge by Doge Coffee, uh, guys, check it out. Uh, Doge Coin Coffee. Buy a bag of the breakfast blend or anything. You say a two a.m. burrito at checkout. You get one of these Doge Gold Plated Cap uh, little things for free. Uh, they look super cool. Much. Much coolness, very well. <laughs> um, but the thing with Tarantino, um, you know, he's going ahead with a Pulp Fiction NFT, even though Miramax is basically suing him and saying you cannot do Tarantino NFTs uh, of Pulp Fiction because Miramax owns Pulp Fiction. Ooh, we own the images, we own the licenses, and Tarantino's no, no, I wrote the script, the script is mine. If I want to do an NFT of page 13 of Pulp Fiction, I should be allowed to do it. Um, and they had threatened him and to stop, and he had stopped for a second, and now he's moving forward with his uh, secret at work NFT sale later this month. Interesting. So that sounds dangerous. I'll be honest. That sounds dangerous because you know something like Pulp Fiction. I mean, I'm sure he's already signed the rights away. So even if he did create it, um, I think legally, that's probably a, a scary decision. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a rough. It's I don't know, man. Like as an artist, you sort of feel like okay, he's an artist. Yeah. It's it's his. <laughs> But you already made that. You already made that money. Yeah. You already signed. You you already signed that the, the the you signed that contract with the devil. The devil being Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. when you made that movie, and now you're gonna try to make a little bit extra. It just seems, it feels a little weird. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, just tell us a little bit about the documentary that you're working on. I know you're working with Palomar College TV, and I know that that it's something that's probably a good counterbalance to the stuff that you do corporate wise. Um, yeah, how do you yeah. how do you feel how do you feel about that type of stuff and what's the documentary about? So um, the documentary is about the transitions program over at Palomar, which helps formerly incarcerated people, um, people who used to you know do drugs, um, you know, find the resources that they need, do some internal work, learn about you know the things that you know might have led them down their path, um, and basically just you know find them on help them find their way. So we've been filming um, with a couple of people um, and, and building an edit around their story. Uh, one of them is Luis. <laughs> um, he, uh, he actually had brought a gun to school to Palomar, but it was because, you know, he had this traumatic thing with his wife, his ex-wife. Um, and, you know, he thought you know, he, uh, he was caught and got taken to prison. And he thought, you know, all of his dreams of becoming a, a, a professor were pretty much done. And, and uh, once he got out, the transitions program helped him out. And now he's going off to UCLA to get his master's. So um, the program's doing a lot of amazing work. And, and we're just trying to capture some of the stories in a, in a really uh, verite kind of style. There you go. And it's definitely um, much better not soul crushing work so it's been a really fun challenge nice nice um one of the things that i really enjoyed about my Ooh. previous career wait Hold did on. i get it wrong it's doge uh D -O -G -E. oh, I, oh yeah yeah yeah. i i did that in i i had to redo the the uh i, I had to redo the i put dodge for some reason like an idiot when i did the thumbnail so i had to redo it sorry there we go there you go Is that Ooh, better? doge coin oh sorry <laughs> Oh, I'm looking right at it, and I and I got it wrong. Sorry, 
buy Dogecoin coffee. Mm-hmm. One more com. time. One, one more there time. We go. That's, why, that's why we edit. it. That's it. Um, one of the things that I enjoyed, um, I was a call center manager for, for, for several years, for like uh, 15 years, or I, I, I was a contact center manager. And a lot of the people that we worked with that came, because you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're working in a call center or something, either it's your first job or you're retired and it's, you know, you want some extra money or your military wife or you are coming out of prison. It's a very, it's a very popular job for mm. people coming right out of jail because, you know, that's, you know. So one of the things, even though I was really good at a, at a job that I wasn't passionate about. Part the one part of my job that I really enjoyed was being a positive experience for people that were coming out of jail as their job. Because I had people that were locked up, and a week later they're working for me, and there's a phone ringing, and I'm like, "Hey, can you pick that phone up for me?" And they would freeze or start crying because if they would have picked up the phone in prison, they would have gotten you know, write-ups or they would have gotten in trouble and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, and people that are coming out of jail and they're really trying their hard to get their life together and I'm their boss. So that part of my job, I sort of, and I probably trained and I had to train people that were coming out of prison with giant swastikas on their neck. Or I had a guy that was one of my best employees and he never thought he was getting out of jail. So he had three X's for three strikes tattooed across his face, like wow. literally just three giant X's. And that guy was like an, a really good rep. He was a re and, and so I had to sort of put myself aside and say, okay, this guy's coming and he's got Nazi stuff. This guy's coming up and he's a gangster. And this, this, this girl used to do this and this and sort of try to be. So that part of my job was, was the part that was most for fulfilling being able to, to be somebody's first boss after jail and then sort of giving them some basic customer service skills that they could use at other jobs, even if they didn't stay where I was. So, so I, that, I think that's a, that's an incredibly good, like I said, I didn't, I didn't like much about my previous career or my previous life, but when I first came out to California, it's the first job that I found that didn't do drug, drug testing. And, uh, I came out and I, and I, and I got the job and, and pretty quickly I became a supervisor and a trainer and I've trained 10, 15,000 people in my career. Um, and I've actually trained people in prison. Like I've trained prison call centers. Um, so, so anything that's, that helps people transition from, from being locked up to, to out is, is a definitely a worthwhile project. So people can follow that along if they, they follow Polymer College and their program and, and what's happening with that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. They have a page, I think, where you can donate to as well um, on the Transitions uh, website, I think. Um, send that to me. I'll, put, I'll put it on the info, on the, on the, uh, on the pod info Yeah, section. that'd be awesome. Um, they, uh, it was originally started, um, I think his name, his last name is pronounced Leva, Martin Leva. Um, and he was a former prisoner as well. And um was basically terrified of going to Palomar College, so he would bring his um, his parole officer with him, and they would literally go to class together because he just felt like nobody else looked like him or act like him at uh, at the college. So, you know, when he realized that other students needed this, he created uh, several different programs in the state of Cal- uh, California where they help formerly incarcerated people, and I mean, they're doing just amazing work. Absolutely, go support them, Palomar College, and 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 their and their and the their transition programs. I'll make sure that I put a link to that program in case anybody wants to donate. Uh, we're talking live. Are we going to the moon? Or is that a good? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let me close the window. That's all right. You're good. <clears throat> all right, we're going to the moon with <laughs> Angela Wong. Heck yeah. Um, You've been you've been you've been incredibly uh, patient with us today, Angela. You've been you've shared a lot of information um, about oh, thank you. uh, about yourself. Uh, I the NFT talk is definitely cool. Um, if you could win either, hold on, I had this written down here. Where did I put that? What? Oh, um, if you could go to Sundance with one of your films or win an Emmy, which one would you want? <laughs> That's hilarious because that's our current debate at work. Um, it would be Sundance. 
there you go. That's, that's a good question. Sundance. All right. Um, rank Michael Moore's filmography. Give me the top three for you. Um, Fahrenheit 11.9, followed by Fahrenheit 9.11, and then Bowling for Columbine. What's the other one? I like uh, searching uh, the one where he's in in uh, in Michigan looking for the head of searching for is it searching for Michael or searching for something? What was the name of that one? I forgot. It's one of his one of his first docs. Was one of my favorites. Um, let me see. I did want to ask you really quickly before we get to our bracket bit in terms of um, in terms of representation and 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 cultural and and cultural sort of specificity. Um, there was a conversation a while back, and I've had this with a lot of Latino filmmakers, so I figured it was it was appropriate to have it with you as well about the you know in the heights you know that that came out and and there's a lot of issues right now within the Latino Latinx community about uh, the authenticity of the films that are finally getting made that represent the Latin experience you know Coco and Canto. Uh, there are some people are like, well, it wasn't Colombian enough because the act. There's my dog back there. There's there's us. Oh, there's my little pup. Um, with uh Encanto and, and other films like that in the Heights specifically, not enough of people felt there wasn't a lot of Afro Latinx. Also, the director for In the Heights was uh the director of Crazy Rich Asians. And I and basically they had okay, we got Lin Manuel Miranda, we got this hot director that's coming off of a successful film, an ethnic film you could call it, or a film that focuses on a specific ethnicity. What could go wrong? One of my points was that the film to me felt that it could have used a director that not necessarily had to be Latino or Latinx, but that was at least from New York. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. And my question was, well, if I was an established filmmaker, would I have been allowed to direct crazy rich Asians? And what would that have made? How would that have changed that film? Um, obviously just like, Latinos and Latinx, you know, Asian representation is also at the forefront or Asian American representation is also at the forefront of the film sort of conversation in terms of more equity, more people, more stories to tell. Um, what side of that do you, what side of that conversation do you feel? Do you feel that, that, that we need to steer more into representation and let people tell their own stories? Or do you feel that it should be more of a meritocracy and that qualified directors and qualified filmmakers should be allowed to tell the stories that they want. Hmm. And of course, you're speaking for the entire Asian culture right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so choose your words carefully, obviously. Yeah, 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 clearly, clearly. Um, I don't know. Um, I think, I think as long as, um, as long as technology is making it super easy for everyone to make films, I, you know, even if it's not that great, I think it's, it's fine. As long as we're putting content out there um, that shows us in however light we want to be portrayed, that's fine. I'm not one to like nitpick about the authenticity of, uh, of something. I, I think as long as you're expressing something that seems true to you, that's, that's fine with me. So you're falling more on the side of like just the more stories about us that are out there, the better. If they're not, even if they're not presented perfectly, it's still, it's still movement, right? Yeah. No, I yeah. definitely agree with movement you. Movement is slow. You know, progress is slow sometimes. So, I'll I'll take it. <laughs> slow motion better than no motion. Mm-hmm. I th I think that you know, like people are like, well, Steven Spielberg directed West Side Story and it's like well Steven Spielberg can literally direct anything he wants. There's no movie where where somebody would be like no Steven, you cannot make that movie, you know. Mm -hmm. Um so I do th I do feel that that it's a tough balance. I want it I want to get to the point where you or I can just direct the movie and it just be bad. And 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 just there's there's so many movies that get made that aren't that good. And it's just like, let's just let us direct some stuff. And, you know, let's, let's just to be the conversation. A movie happened. This mm -hmm. was the director moving on. It wasn't, you know, like, I don't, I don't think it, but I think since, since there's so little representation, it's like, oh, this guy won an Oscar. This guy got nominated for that. There's finally this, this girl's directing Eternals and this guy got this. And so I understand why people are pushing and why people get upset um, because for, 95% of the history of cinema, people like you and I were not allowed 
to direct anything. And mm-hmm. we weren't even able to represent ourselves on screen. Mm-hmm. You know, there's been brown face, yellow face, all these kinds of things that have happened, you know, um, for the first 99 percent of cinema. It's mm-hmm. how it was. Absolutely. And now we're in now we're in this now we're in the one percent and we're sort of oversteering to the other way because it's been fucked up for so long. And I definitely understand the people that want to get all our representation on the screen. But I do feel that we need to have a little bit of subtle, not subtlety about it. I'll just be smart about it because we can't just keep shedding on everything that comes out because it's not perfect. Mm-hmm. That's kind of, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Okay. Okay. I like that. You like that? Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. And then um, what should I binge first? Uh, Euphoria or Cobra Kai? I don't know if you've even seen those shows, but. I have not. Mm. I have Why not I ask you? seen either. Why am I asking you? Why I asking you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to get to something that I like to do at the end of each. Uh, oh, what's your go-to gear right now? What's your favorite? What's your favorite camera? Um, oh, man. So I, I recently purchased a, a Red Komodo. Um, oh. And so I've been playing around with that. Um, but I, I still love the Sony a7 III. <laughs> it's just so light and run and gun. Honestly, it was between the uh, Sony. What was it? um fx3 the tiny one mm-hmm. um which is, but also is a cinema line camera um and that or the red komodo and uh komodo one out yeah is uh how's the how's the battery noise on that red it's not bad at all no yeah i i've, I've worked with like um bigger of the other ones like the older models and those were pretty loud <laughs> you the like Komodo it? was surprisingly quiet yeah yeah, the dragon and some of these other ones are yeah. They're just they're, just, they're beast, but man. it's like a little AC. Do you think it's ever going to get to the point where um, these cameras are going to be so overclocked that you just point the camera at a room and then figure out your angle and lighting afterwards? Oh, definitely, you think, dude. You have think you that... seen, um, there's a show on Amazon. Fuck, I forgot what it was called, but it's like a sci-fi show. And eventually, I think in like the second or third season, they have this producer lady show up and like document the hero's experience it's kind of dumb but basically she has this drone that just floats up and like she just tells it to point in this direction and i'm assuming if you think about it like from a pragmatic practical production standpoint it's probably filming everything like in a wide shot and then you can crop in and post is how i imagine it but yeah that, that would be super cool that seems super interesting. The, the The reason I even figure that out is we were doing a we were doing a film for a film competition, and we were and my friend had just bought a Horatio, a who uh, Cinema Viva Studios in downtown. He had just oh, so what do you scratch yourself for? What you got? You got the scratchies? What you doing, buddy? <laughs> um, and he, we were doing it. He had just bought like a like a 16k Red Dragon or something, or just a brand new. No, no, he had like a 16k Black cin- uh, Cinema. Um, and he was like, "Let's shoot it on this." And I was like, "Okay." And I my my editing rig could not handle the the 8k footage, and I had to bring in another editor. Um, and when we made the movie, we did a wide, and then we did close ups. And I sent him all the footage when he was editing, and he's like, "Dude, why did you set up differently for close-ups?" And I was like, "Because that's how you make movies. You do a wide shot, and then you do a close-up." And he's like, "I just use the original shot for everything." So oh, and just punch in. So 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 yeah. So he had so much space that he had the he had the 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 full shot, and then for the close-ups, he just he just punched in and got the close-ups from the same shot that we used. Wow. And 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 when he told me that, I was just like. I was just like mind blown. What the hell was that? So that that's when I was like, man, it's getting to the point where you can just point camera, get some light, do the thing. We'll figure the rest out later. Which did is, you, I like. Did you notice any like um, quality loss from like cropping in like that? No, because we were shooting at like 8K raw in the fine, and then the final video was a 4K version of the video, and mm. I didn't see any loss or anything. Wow. So he, he had enough room to go to get in there, like you know. So I was just I, I, that was the first time That's where I was efficient. like, <laughs> if you don't have to shoot close-ups, yeah, yeah, cuts your production time by like in half. 
also indie filmmaking sometimes you can cheat because if you have one actor that's not as good as the other one then or the one actor that's not really getting their lines right then you do the shot of the person who has their lines nailed so that the other actor can be cheating and 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 memorizing their lines so that when you turn over that actor is more mm-hmm. prepared that's kind of like an indie cheat code but if you can just get it on you know also i don't think 4k 8k is really great for actors and their skin because you can see everything so mm. clearly every pore, anyway every pimple. angela angela you've been a very interesting guest we've had a great conversation about your life and film your background your Thanks. projects Thank that you. are ongoing as well as um as well as nfts and and, and that whole thing uh i do want to do one last segment before i let you go and that's something that we like to call the bracket bit That I love, is <laughs> I love the production value. I did that. Uh, Kurt, who was watching earlier, he did the song for me. Uh, I hit him up and I said, hey, I need something for my bracket bed. He's like, what do you want? And I was like, I kind of want something like the Wayne's World thing. Wayne's World, Wayne's World. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he's like, can you record it for me? So I grabbed my phone. I recorded that in one take. I was like, it should be something like bracket bed. Woo, woo. <laughs> and I sent that to him. He composed the song around it. And then we sent it to my other friend, Jovi, and she did the backing vocals. And mm. uh, and and that's and that's where the and all my and all my songs for all my bits are going to be one take like that because they, they nice. Just, they, no, I fun. definitely felt the homage. I was like, this sounds really familiar, but I couldn't <laughs> quite place it. <clears throat> you love film, you love crypto, you love NFTs, but you also love dogs. So our bracket bit for mm-hmm. today is going to be called "Dog Eat Dog World." It's a doggy dog world, as we all know. I'm going to give you two breeds of dog, and you're going to tell me which one moves on to the next round. Now, the bracket bit is created by me for maximum pain, but <laughs> the, the 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 justification. So you can figure out if you were going to buy uh, a comp- if you were going to get a dog tomorrow, which one of these would you get? Which one do you think is a better breed? Which one do you like the most? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. The choice is yours. Are you ready? Oh boy. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And I know the first one. <laughs> we got uh in the number one spot, we got the Shiba versus French Bulldogs. Shiba all the way. Shiba all the way. Next one we got boxers wait, wait, versus wait, wait, wait. Geek. They they don't fight at the end, right? This is just picking um a dog that I would want. If your methodology for fixing you can say which one of these two dogs would, would win in a fight. Which one of these dogs would you... If there were two dogs walking down the street and you could only pet one, which one would it be? If you had to if you had to buy... If you had to take care of a dog. Whatever you want. Okay. So okay. so it can be a fight if you want it to be a fight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which, one, which one would be the best for the next meme coin? <laughs> Boxer coin. Oh, that's a good one, too. Okay. But well, well, maybe, maybe that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll get to the last answer and we'll make a meme token based off of that dog we'll call it it whatever burrito boxers versus beagles beagles Mm, they're so cute with the big fluffy ears yeah poodles versus dobermans what kind of poodle is this like a golden doodle type thing it's i guess all poodles are together in one here because i only use one poodle all right poodle yeah our neighbors have a doberman and they're they're kind of scary looking Dobermans were hot in the eighties, and <laughs> and then they I don't, I don't know man, but they got they got they're a little scary man. They look super serial. Mm-hmm. All right, Shih Tzu or pugs? Shih Tzu. Pugs are man's arrogance. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> these, I these feel poor, so bad. These poor beasts have horrible breathing. <laughs> As I cough. <laughs> they, they're they 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 need so much care, and we just decided that we wanted something short and funny looking, and and we made and them. inbred them, yeah, and it's, inbred them. It's it's awful. 
Uh, chows versus bulldogs. Um, can you pull up what a chow looks like? I'm pretty sure I, I, I have an idea. Uh, chows are um, chow chow. There you go. Oh no, that's chow mein. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick that. A chow 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 is the dog breed. There we go. Mm, all right, yeah, one. I'll go with chows. Chows, okay. Mm-hmm. Chow, chows over chads. All right, hang on a second. All right, chows going through. Uh, Dalmatians or Rottweilers? Uh, Dalmatians. Dalmatians. Uh, Only one of them, though, not a hundred. Cocker mm-hmm. Spaniel or German Shepherd? Can you pull up the Cocker Spaniel? Absolutely. I'll be I don't like where this is going. Now I have to pick between <laughs> all the ones that I like? Damn it. <laughs> I'm going to draw Spaniel. I'm not going to even try to write Cocker Spaniel. What was the other Rottweiler? Uh, no, I'll go with a Rottweiler. Right. These, yeah, they look a little too frizzy. Rottweiler. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, German oh, wait, Shepherd. No, was German other. Shepherd. All right, yeah, yeah I'll go is. with Shepherd. Also, you moved to the second round. Good job. Uh, wait, did I put Chow twice? I put Chow twice. Let's see. What is? Uh, let's see. Uh, Papillon, which is Papillion? a small Papillon. I yeah, think, let's see what uh, it looks like. The Papillon. Let's see what we do. Papillion are these are are. Uh, Sounds so French. Yeah, they are. They're uh, they're little. <laughs> they're, they're the little things. The papillon. Oh, these are pretty cute too. What was the yeah. other option? I uh, put in chow, chow twice. Oh. But papillon works wins. All right, wins, all, right. all right. This one you should know: Chihuahua or Golden Retriever. I'll go with a Chihuahua. And I didn't put your I didn't put your dog breed there because your dog is a husky, right? No, it's a Shiba. It's a Shiba. Oh, it's okay. I thought it was. A, I thought, oh yeah, I thought for some reason. For some reason, I I thought I was like, is that a husky or a Shiba? It, he's it's because he's looking older. Okay, Boston Terrier or Saint Bernard. I'll go with the Saint Bernard. Yeah, they can also bring you whiskey if you're lost in the mountain. They got that those barrels, right? That's what they do. <laughs> Australia. I mean, that's what I know them from from the cartoons. Australian mm-hmm. Shepherd or Greyhound. Shepherd. You run- Shepherds. You know, Shepherd. Yeah. Pit Bull or Labradoodle. Oh, Labradoodle. Labradoodle, how dare you? How dare you eliminate my... Sorry. Sorry, Shy Girl. Sorry, All right, my, my ex had a pit bull, so... Oh, okay. There you go. Okay, I understand. Uh, Maltese or Pomeranian? Maltese. Great Dane or Dachshund? Dachshund. Dachshund. I don't even know how to pronounce that. Uh, uh, Otherwise let's, known let's... as a wiener dog. Yeah, let's look up a Great Dane. Great Dane is like uh, I could remember how to type. Great Dane is just a big giant. Oh, this one. All right, my friend just got one of these. Yeah. Oh, it's a. Horse we'll dog. go with a Great Dane. Yeah. Horse Massive. dog. They're humongous. Uh, border Collie or Basset Hound. Border Collie. Corgi or Labrador. Uh, Labrador. Or Actually, you know what? Collie. Let me let me go with Corgi. Corgi or Border Collie? I think Corgis are also another example of man's uh, hubris, if you will. But I like them better than the pugs. Pugs feel, I just feel like pugs have like such a miserable life. Mm -hmm. I agree. Corgis, um, a friend of mine, she actually takes her Corgi up to somewhere in Escondido, some farm. And she's Uh teaching it how to herd sheep, which is what they're originally bred for. Yeah. Yeah, it's are pretty they cool. like so the, are they like the, mini border collies basically right they're i guess like, so yeah okay. the, um they're they're like in this little pen there's like four sheep and she's trying to get the dog to like run around them kind of herd them into a certain area it's pretty funny i, I would love to see a tv show about that <laughs> teaching corgis how to become sheep dogs i would love that versus border collies all right so now um damn it damn it damn it border collie Border Collie. Sorry, short dog. And I mean, Sorry. if you see the you ever see like the corgi races, those are always fun. Or the mm-hmm. corgis when they they the, when the corgis try to do the 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 little obstacle courses. All mm-hmm. right, we got a Maltese versus a Great Dane. Oh, I hate this. Um, Great Dane. Great Dane takes dumps bigger than a Maltese. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. La- Labradoodle or Australian Shepherd. Labradoodle. Labradoodle. Sorry. Labradoodle. Don't worry about it. This is your bracket. <laughs> St. Bernard or Chihuahua? All right. We'll go with the Chihuahua. 
You got a lot of big dog, little dog action happening here. Mm -hmm. Papillon or German Shepherd? German Shepherd. Dalmatian or Chow? Dalmatian. Shih Tzu or Poodle? Poodle. And the Shiva versus the Shiva. Shiba, Shiba. Shiba's having an easy ride. Shiva versus yeah. Poodle. Shiba. <laughs> Dalmatian versus Shepherd. Dalmatian. Chihuahua versus Labradoodle. Labradoodle. And Great Dane versus Border Collie. Great Dane. Great Dane. I really don't like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> this is hard. You got your final four. We got Labradoodle versus Great Dane. Oh, God. I'll go with a Great Dane. Great Dane. And we have the Shiva versus the Dalmatian. The meme coin versus the classic Disney movie. Yeah. Doge all the way. Doge all the way. And then we have the Shiva versus the Great Dane in the final. Was there ever any doubt? <laughs> no. I honestly, I looked at your dog and I was like, the dog looks like a Shiva, but I think it's a Husky because I didn't know that there were that were that, that there was a lot of Shivas that were like black or dark like that because mm -hmm. you always see the you always see the yellowish Shivas. Yeah, is Husky even on this list? I don't think it was. No, it wasn't on the list because I thought your dog was a Husky, oh. so I was like, I'm not gonna put Husky because that's automatically gonna win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this: If if Sheba wasn't there, but if if Husky was there instead of Sheba, would you think it have gone the same way? Oh no, not at all. No, because I mean, you would have done what if it were a Husky versus Beagle or Husky versus Poodle? Yeah, so, something would have changed at that point. Something would have changed. Well, I didn't do it. All right, I messed it up. It's all right. <laughs> not it. every bracket is going to be perfect. You love your dog, which is the – I love seeing pictures of older dogs because I have older dogs. And uh, that's one of my favorite sayings is everybody thinks they have the best dog and nobody's wrong. You know? <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, uh, again, um, Angela, everybody go make sure that if you aren't already, uh, follow her uh, and start to finish uh, her – media company if you need corporate videos but you also want them to have a little bit of soul uh, <laughs> uh then you should you should go with her also as we were talking earlier go to where are my banners at buy dogecoincoffee.com and you can buy your coffee with doge so That's if you right. made a little money if you made a little money doge goes up a little bit Treat yourself to some gourmet coffee. And if you use the code 2AM Burrito, which I will when I get my bag, because I want one of those things for my mantle, Heck you yeah. will get a free um a free Dogecoin gold little, plated coin. Yeah. Gold plated thing placard that you can put up as decoration, etc. 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 Uh I hope you had a good time. Oh, I did. I was like, where's the audience reaction here? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me let me find my uh, uh I do want to thank you again, Angela, for coming on. I'm glad that, you know, just because like I said, I've I've you've been peripherally, you know, been Facebook friends for a while. Yeah. Follow same. your work, follow your work. So, you know, like I said, at the very least, uh these conversations allow me to have some in-depth chats with with cool people that I normally wouldn't get to meet and talk to. Um, so it was great learning about your story, about your past, about your passions. And uh, thank you for the, all the insight that you provided about like, you know, people that might be trying to dip their toe into the crypto and, and NFT spaces. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward I, to uh, your other videos, man. No, no. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, look, I, hopefully uh, in the near future, there's a, there's a TV show that needs a couple of diverse directors and we can each do a couple of episodes and we can collaborate on something like that. But we wish you nothing but the best of luck in with your documentary. We'd love to get be able to promote it or talk about it when it's when it's ready. Um, we'll try to make sure we link people to the donation page for the documentary for Palomar. And uh, and again, thank you. Um, I'll be back in 30 seconds. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you. He's out.